All right, so uh, here we are. Uh, I'm a state of mind, and I'm very, very excited to have Mia St. John on because she is a, a five-time world international champion boxer. Come on, man. Dang. I mean, you, yeah, that's exciting. I mean, it's exciting. I mean, that's not... And for a beautiful woman, I don't know how, how, they, how you do it, but, but we'll get into that. Um, and that's why I, I, I've been watching her for a long time. Actually, I just saw her in a, a clip, and I, put her, I said something on Twitter because I couldn't believe how... I knew she was great, but I couldn't believe how skillful she was. Like, straight punches and, you know, everything was just amazing. But, uh, so, she's here today, and, uh, oh, if you, if you like what you see today, could you subscribe, hit this little button right here. You see that, Mia? Look at that button. Wait. Bam! Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, let's, let's get into it. So, this is Mia St. John, and, Hello. you know, how you doing? This show Good. is kind of like... You never know what I'm going to do from one second to the yeah. next, and it's fine. And we're, I, I just, I just have a sense that we're going to be uh, getting into some deep stuff here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm excited. And you know, you and I have a lot in common that you yeah. don't look. At, just let me explain to you what we have in common. You're Mexican. I'm yes. Spanish. You took Taekwondo. Yeah. I took Taekwondo. You're a great boxer. You have done so much for mental health. Yeah. You got a book? As you have. I yeah. got a book. Yeah, you're right. So we just, you know, we're like this, right? Yeah. Um, so you grew up in San Francisco. Where in San Francisco? Well, I don't know San Francisco. I was born in 67. Oh. And it was like the height of the Vietnam War and the hippies, you know. So uh, that's all I remember about it. I was like two years old when we oh. moved. But I do remember the era very well 67. because on every corner I remember the protesters yes of the me Vietnam too. War. yeah and um and I specifically remember the hippies and but how nice they were to me and always giving me yeah, candy yeah. and my mom was like don't take the candy from them and, and the Hare yeah. Krishna oh yes. yes yes yeah but we moved to SoCal like shortly thereafter. Uh, so I don't really know San Francisco. Well, the weather SoCal girl. is not great. It's no, always foggy. I hate and, yeah. the weather. Yeah, I'm good. definitely a Southern California girl. Uh, but you so you did take Taekwondo. For like 23 years, I was like a double black belt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to get into a little psyche here. How does somebody who looks like you get into that? I mean, it, was it hard back then, or did people say, what are you doing, or how? No, because if you remember, like, we're, we're pretty much the same era. Bruce Lee was, like, yes. so popular back then. I get you, yeah. Right, and my dad was obsessed with, like, he was a nuclear engineer, but he was just obsessed with Bruce Lee and the whole Me martial too. arts. Yeah, and so he put himself in Taekwondo, and he decided to put his kids he he had two girls me and my sister but he really wanted a boy which he got later but so he kind of raised us as boys so we never our looks were never talked about wow and pretty was never a word that came up in my Ooh, household i like and that. so we were very tomboyish and so it was it seemed very natural and at first i hated taekwondo and it was just something i was forced to do um, but then after the years went by, I began to, to fall in love with it. What about boxing? How'd you get into that? That's what I, that... so, you know, what's crazy is again, like it was the era, like it was the era of Rocky and I wanted to be Rocky and I wanted to change my room to have R-O-C-K-Y on it. And, um, uh, I just dreamt about it like every day every night that I would be a world champion boxer Are and I would serious? just yeah watch myself in my mind like walk from the dressing room through the tunnel to the ring and smoke be blowing and the audience and 
um, and, and you know, I was so young, and, and women weren't really boxing then. There yeah, were, yeah. but they weren't right. like on TV, and there were no tournaments or anything. So I had to wait until finally, it was like in the 90s, and all of a sudden, Christy Martin emerges. Yes. And she's on the Tyson cards. And I was like, holy fuck. How old were you? I was, by this time, I was already like in my 20s. Okay. I was still in Taekwondo, I was still competing, and I was focused on the Sydney Olympics. But then I saw her and I went, shit, like now's my opportunity. And so I begged my trainer and he was like, no, you're going to get injured and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I found a manager, found a trainer. And I had big hopes because my mom, you know, she was from Mexico and she always taught me that, that we create our reality, like in our yeah, minds, sure, our yeah. consciousness. Yeah. And so whatever I wanted, I could obtain. And I believed her, you know, I'm, I'm a kid and this is my mom and this is what she believes. And so I said, you know, in my mind and to others, I'm going to sign with Don King because he was the biggest. Right. And they were like, you're crazy. Like, you can't just, like, do that. You don't just, like, come out of nowhere and, like, not even box and say you're going to. Anyway, I wrote him a letter, sent him a picture. And next thing I knew, he called my manager and flew us out to Florida, signed me. And um, Did he watch? Well, you probably sent him a tape before. How, no. How did he know that you're no, great? No, I just sent him my record in Taekwondo and said, look, I want to switch. I want to turn pro in boxing, and will you turn me pro? And so, of course, I had to go through all the training. Yeah, yeah. And the build-up where, you know, you go in for your first fight, and, you know, they build you up slowly. Like, the girls get better and yeah. better. First, they, you start out, like, with a girl that, that is kind of like you, doesn't really know how right. to box. And then they slowly build you up to better and better and better and better. But did early on, did you know that you were – you had that talent. I mean, you were that you were good, and somebody said, "Damn." You know, I didn't even become technical, technically sound, or a good fighter until later. Oh. It took me time, but what I had was heart. Like you, to take me down, you would need a freaking <laughs> back truck or a two wow. by four. Like nothing was going to take me down. Like, I was going to beat you into submission, and that's how I fought. Later, I learned how to be technical and learn yeah, defense, yeah. and but that took time. But I had so much heart. You know, I was crazy. I mean, I was a crazy kid. I had all these dysfunctions. I was diagnosed with panic disorder, anxiety, GAD, um, OCD. Um, I was a very anxiety-ridden child. With that much anxiety, this is always because... You know, I'm I'm an actor, obviously, and it's amazing that somebody like that's an actor, or especially a boxer, that has anxiety and I'm by, the whole thing can get can do it, because it's yeah. a, I mean, you have like you said, you had no one's gonna take you down. I have that side of me, right? But yeah. I also have a very fragile side. Yes, that very fragile. Yes, so. I've had to deal with that fragile side with acting, but you dealt with it with boxing. Right, and and we're very similar, like you said, because even though I wasn't an actor, I kind of was, because when I was sitting in the dressing room, I would be so scared, like, you know, shaking Damn. and sweating. And, right. And, oh, God, like, you know, pure panic would set oh into me. And I would say to myself, you are not Mia St. John. Mia St. John is a is a boxer. You are, I would be someone else, but I would act like I was Mia St. John, who the public knew. And so I would go out there and pretend to be this fearless wow. champion boxer that had no fear and that was tough. And it, it kind of made it easy for me because I, I was, I pretended like I was just acting in a part. Wow. 
you know, like and that would that would help. That would help because I could stay little old me who was shy and quiet and introvert, and I could keep that inside of me, but I could portray this outgoing because I was never outgoing. Like when it came to the fans, they scared me. Oh. Like all that, like can I blah, blah, blah. yeah after fights like that put me into such anxiety mode and and it helped again to pretend you are Mia St. John the boxer and then I could go out and do all that but but it, towards the end of my career for some reason like all that anxiety and panic started to get worse and I couldn't like I would have to fight mm. and go right back to the dressing room and not talk to anyone not sign any autographs not see anyone i couldn't even i couldn't do it anymore whoa now when you were in the fight you never had any kind of that panic in the fight no ah. once the bell rang yeah. once like when crawling through the ropes when the fight first began like my legs were like noodles. I said I'm never going to get through those ropes. But once mm. I did, once the bell rung, it was on. It was over. Like I was in my element. Wow. And, and the fans and the That's... roar of the crowd like the You music, had 70 fights. No, yeah, none of it mattered. I was in my element. And and tunnel vision. I wanted to talk because I went for a walk today and I thought I was thinking of you. and thinking like how important breathing is. Oh yeah. To, I to, I meditate before my fights. And that obviously I always, yeah, I had to. Do you know last year when I went through this hell with anxiety. I tried to meditate and all that and everything worked out. Nothing was I was in the worst shape ever. Like nothing was going to help me. But now I meditate and it's great. Yeah. I get I'm it's, crying. Yeah. I'm crying. It's euphoric. It's badass, but it's the only thing that gets me through my anxiety. What about breathing? Does that Breathe I breathe during my meditation. Okay. And it's honestly it's the only thing that saves me. Damn. It saves me. It really is. You just do it and then it, you feel better I after. I have to do I do it 3 times a day, morning, afternoon. Really? I have to. Because I suffer from such anxiety that I have to get through my day, and that's the only way I can. Wow, three times a day—that's that's a yeah. <sighs> Now you have an organization called uh, El Saber. El Saber es poder. Es poder. Yeah. And it deals. You help people with mental illness. With addiction. mental illness, addiction. Um, and in Mexico we have a center a computer center which is for education um for kids that only go up to the third grade um they have they literally come to school with no shoes um some of them don't have running water electricity um but we provided a center that had electricity and um computers and internet um So yeah, and then in the United States we do mental illness and and addiction. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful. Thank you. Now, I was I've been talking to people about why isn't there mental health in schools? Right. What what, what, what who's said who's not doing that? Well, and you know in New Jersey they have in their curriculum they have mental health 101. Oh, they do. Yeah, but not in the rest of the US. It's not like federal. Um each state, you know, decides what they're going to do, but to me it should be mandatory. That's what I'm saying. Cuz how many kids like as a kid, I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I knew something was wrong with my brain. Um cuz I wasn't like other kids. And so god, wouldn't have that been great if we had mental health when I went to someone to tell you what is anxiety, what is depression, what is this, what is that. When you hear voices, like how many of us that suffer from these illnesses hear voices from time to time? Yes. Um 
and wouldn't it have been great to know that we're not alone? Yeah, but you had anxiety and everything when you were young, right? Yeah. I didn't. Mine okay. only started at 21. Okay, wow. And that's 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 kind of, yeah, common. I know. But yeah. you had it, it's, for you, it would have been had, incredible yeah. to know at yeah. a young age. I yeah. know a friend of mine in high school, he was having a nervous breakdown. And we all ran from him. Yeah. Because we didn't know. We didn't know. But if yeah. I knew that what comes with a nervous breakdown is a lot of pain yeah. and a lot of suffering and it's not, you know, we might have had more compassion. Right. So I'm thinking, let's, why, do, why isn't it in every school? Yeah. Let's have mental health. Yeah. I'm going to. It should be mandatory. I think so. Yeah. At I least. Mean, look at, look at like the rise in suicide rates I in know. our young population. Kids as young as, you know, eight years old. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's it, it really should be at least an option. Yeah. But mandatory would be even better. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, with the pandemic, the pandemic was obviously good and bad. I mean, obviously the the, the suicide rate in the last year probably is through the, through the roof, yeah. right? And the addiction rate, the relapse Com rate. Yeah. But I think the awareness is more because of. Right. Right? It brought it to the forefront. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I believe also that my book would did well because of the time. Yeah. yeah. The people needed to. Um, right. Now, I'm going to bring up, obviously, something that uh, you, you take me on the ride, mm -hmm. whatever ride you want to mm -hmm. go on, if you don't want to talk about anything, uh, about uh, Julian. Mm -hmm. And he was 24 when he passed mm -hmm. away. You know, this is going to be hard for me because I, I already feel emotional. Mm -hmm. So what happened? Do you want to talk about mm -hmm. that? Yeah, you know, it's it's important, you know. Yes, it is important. My son was 24. He suffered from schizophrenia and he had signs early on as a teenager and mental health would have definitely benefited him. He didn't know. He was hearing voices and he was ashamed to tell me or his father because, you know, he didn't know what was happening. Um, and that led to addiction, self-medicating. And we had him in and out of rehabs um, and in and out of mental health facilities. And the last one we put him in um, well, you know, I was always, Christoph always said I was the helicopter parent. Like every time my son called, oh, he was my baby. He was, <laughs> he was, he right. was my firstborn, my only son. I mean, he could do no wrong. He, in my eyes, was the love of my life. And so when he called, Mom, come get me out, like I would just go running. Like mm. I'm there, baby. And, you know, Christoph would say no more. Like, he'll never get sober. And for those who don't know, Christoph St. John, I'll, I'll say, uh, was a, a great man. I didn't know him very well. But I knew of him, and I met him. And he was a great actor. And um, he's, he was loved. Yeah, he really was. He was so special. Um, he was also the love of my life, but but I, I have to say that m my son was, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, he, he was so the what true love he, of my life. So was he drinking too to self medicate or drugs or? So he he was mainly addicted to meth. Oh, yeah, and it was a tough one. We had him in a lot of rehabs, and like I said, he would call me like, "Mom, he, I swear I'll never do this again. If you just come get me out, I'll never do it again." And I would go running because I wanted to believe him. Yes. You know, and I would take him out. And then sure enough, like two weeks later, he'd be, um, he'd run away from home, homeless on the streets again, naked, half naked. No. Um, you know, dropping all this weight. And he was a tall kid. He was like 6'2". And I would find him in the parks. I would find him downtown. I would, and I was always searching for him with, you know, um, 
LAPD or sheriff's notices missing, you know, and I would always find him in, in the worst shape, bring him back home, clean him up, get him back into rehab. So this one rehab we put him in was for dual diagnosis for mental illness and uh, addiction. And um, again, he called me and said, Mom, I'll never do it again if you get me out. And and I said, okay. And his dad said, there's no way you're not getting him out. And I said, okay, I promise. And so I left him and, um, and two days later I got a phone call that he had taken his life. And that phone call that was the worst day of my life the worst day of my life it's the worst phone call I think you could ever get you know that your son is gone wow and and you know the unfortunate thing was that his father never forgave himself he couldn't and even though you know it was not his fault Mm -mm. It was not his fault. Mm -mm. And when you think you're doing the right thing for your child, you know, that's all he had in his heart was the best intention. Exactly. Was to get exactly. his child sober. Absolutely. And, but for some reason, he could not let that go. And you would talk to him and he'd say, I can't let it go, or he didn't say he, anything. Yeah, yeah, he would cry and he would cry. And you know, he relapsed and went back to drinking and um, he became a chronic alcoholic, um, drinking, you know, from morning to night. And I would find him just blubbering with pictures of Julian surrounding him. and. Oh. Um, I'd have to drive him to work and he couldn't do his lines and I'd have to drive him back and it just got worse. He just spiraled. He just spiraled into like this deep, dark hole and it was almost like he just couldn't get out. So, and you couldn't, you couldn't get him out. You couldn't say to him anything. It didn't matter, I, right? I tried everything. Yeah. I tried everything. And um, we did get him, in the end, we did get him into rehab. And he left three days later and went right back. And um, I remember the day, the morning he called me. Um, and he just said, he was crying and crying. It was Super Bowl Sunday, 2019. And he looks forward to Super Bowl. Oh my God, he was like yeah. such a football fan. But he called me that morning and he said, I just can't do it. And he said, I just wanna die. And I gave him every reason to live. He had, he had two daughters. And yeah. And, um, one of the last things he said to me was, um, Julian's here. And he's just going to take me for a walk and we're going to be okay. Oh, fuck. Oh, wow. Well, the reason it gets me so emotional, aside from the obvious, is because I had a, I was going, to, I, I, I had thoughts, and I remember telling my son, you know, which is, he didn't have his son, but my son was in the car and I was crying, I said, I'm not going to do it, I can't go on anymore, buddy, mm. and then he said, what, Dad? I said, I can't go, I can't do it anymore. Can't, because it was enormous pain. Mm. And he looks at me, he goes, you're gonna do it, Dad, because I'm gonna take care of you. 
And to think of Christoph, you know, whatever I was feeling, his is so much more. And with when you self-medicate, it's almost unbearable. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand, because people always say to me, well, what, what, why? Why do people? I said, you don't understand what that pain's like, man. Yeah. You don't you don't fucking know, man. It's it's the pain that you think in your head that you can't do another day with it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna end this uh, thing now, just because you've done such a beautiful job, and I appreciate it. Thank you. And I appreciate you for doing this. Thank you. And being so open, and brave. So I just want to say, um, if you ever need to talk or anything, you, I'm Thank here. Thank you. I'm here Thank for you. you. I think it's important for people to know um, because I don't think people realize like the pain yes. that someone's in. That's right. You know, and I feel like. Um, In the end, I, I don't quite think that people, they knew that he was in terrible shape, but they didn't know that how deep that pain was, you know? Right. And the only thing, the only solace for me is, because I'll tell you, when when Christoph passed, it was, um, you know, I relapsed. I had 30 years of sobriety. Oh, my God. And I relapsed. And um, I felt like I just wanted to go, too. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to be with sure. him. And because here you have, you know, the two loves of my life are now gone. And that's all I felt was I just I just want to be with them. Um, so I don't think people really understood, like, they would be like, well, you still have your daughter. and But at the moment and at the time, you're not thinking that. You're just like, I'm in so much pain. I just got to get out. I just got to get out of this pain however I can. And for me, it was the bottle was what I knew. Mm, yeah. And, and that's what I did. But that's temporary. That's self-medicating, right? It's temporary. That's why... You wake up the next morning, you do it all over again. Yeah. You know, it's a cycle. And that's what happened to Christoph was he just got caught up in that cycle. Yeah, yeah. And couldn't get himself out. Um, but I truly believe that when he told me that Julian was there, I really believe he was. My son was there, and my son did come to save him. I believe it. To take him from his pain. Yeah. Because people say, well, he was, you know, because he was, he had a 3.4 alcohol level when he passed. Yeah. Um, so they said, well, he was probably hallucinating. And I said, no, he, my son was there. And my son took him. Which is a, it, it's, it's a it's kind of a, Beautiful thing, but a sad mm -hmm. thing at the same time, mm -hmm. right? But I believe in that, yeah. and I and I can't. And another thing I'll say is, you're here, man. You survived mm -hmm. that, and I think it's your, it's your fighting heart, you know. Right. I mean, I I have to think that way and feel that, like, no, like, I can't give up. Right. Like, you know, I am a fighter. Right. That's, right. I've got to I've got to go on yes wow and it's been a struggle it's not like oh no like I get it one yeah. day, like my sobriety is like gone in and out in and out off and on off and on and um it but that's my journey yeah you know that is my journey and 
and um, I'm sober now and and I feel in the end you know I will be that that person that that fighter that yeah. you know I will make it I well, will I, I think you already made it thank you <laughs> I mean thank you. you already made it you just got to just keep going forward and you're here and and you know and all and this kind of stuff will help so many people yeah your, I, that's your what voice, i hope your your voice okay you just do me a favor when this comes out just read the comments okay and you're gonna go yeah whoa yeah because i know i know yeah and you, what you just did today was amazing thank you Thank you so much, Maurice. <laughs> <laughs>